Chapter 10 Lerida Once the distant lights of Sanctuary Outpost had faded from sight, Adelaide and the crew took their places at the map table and spread the parchment out in front of them. Lorena wasn't entirely certain what form Simeon's memories would take, but she assumed some kind of map or chart would be involved. Rather, the parchment contained just two lines of spidery writing. On strangled shores my ship you seek, begin your search at Tribute Peak. Privately, Lorena didn't think that this was much to go on, and certainly not worth the grief they'd been through to obtain the information. The others seemed satisfied with what little they knew, though, and clustered around the table until they located Tribute Peak in a distant corner of the map. While Faisal and Ned headed above decks to set a course, Adelaide asked Lorena to linger for a moment. I'm sure you must think this is all just a wild goose chase, she said preemptively. Surprised, Lorena nodded. Oh, don't look so startled. You don't hide your emotions that well. Well, I expected something a little less cryptic, Lorena retorted, indicating the parchment. It barely tells us anything, assuming it can even be trusted. It can, Adelaide said firmly. Memories aren't always easy to interpret, but they don't lie. Besides, I knew Captain Simeon, back when he was alive, I mean. I was a deckhand on his crew when I was young. You were? Lorena stared. That didn't stop you from pulling his head clean off. Adelaide merely shrugged. Better to be properly at rest than rattling around as a pile of bones for all eternity. He'd have thanked me. She gave Lorena a look. Or are you saying you wouldn't want me to do the same for you if it came to it? It won't. Are you saying you know for sure that these memories of Simeon's are going to lead us to something good? Adelaide moved to the Unforgiven's tiny kitchen and began to fish around in cupboards and cabinets until she produced a bottle of dark red wine and two tankards. He ran a tight ship, did Simeon. As far as he was concerned, the captain's word was law, so he never used to tell the crew much. How terrible to be kept out of the loop like that, Lorena said dryly, which earned her a scowl along with a proffered share of the wine. She took both with good humour. One night, I was up late. Adelaide took a deep swig of her drink and looked vaguely embarrassed. Truth was... I was stealing food from the galley, so when old Steel Eye came in, I hid. I still don't really know why I did it. Perhaps I was already fed up of following orders. Anyway, him and his first mate started talking, and Simeon told her that he was sure he'd found it this time. Sure that he'd found a clue to Athena's fortune. It took all Lorena's self-control not to choke on her wine, and she was glad that the tankard obscured her shocked expression. The Unforgiven had been in dock when she'd arrived. Was it possible that Adelaide had been somehow goading her all this time, attempting to influence her actions with those stupid handwritten notes? This was a hell of a way to reveal her trickery, if so. No, she decided after a moment. This was no prank, for there was no trace of mischief on Adelaide's face, and she'd have been unable to disguise her glee at a successful joke. Lorena decided to play dumb. What's Athena's fortune? she asked, disinterestedly, reaching for the wine and topping up their glasses as though they were discussing any old trinket. She expected Adelaide to scoff at the question, but the captain seemed happy enough to answer. I didn't know either, not back then. Whatever it was sounded very important anyway. Important enough for Simeon to risk life and limb going after it. I might have learned more, but at that point, a rat bit my ear. I yelped, and they found me. Flogged me, of course, and put me off the ship at the next port. 
but I kept hunting for clues, and eventually I found an old fiddle player in a tavern who told me that Athena's fortune is what they call the most valuable treasure of the pirate lord. And then, Lorena said slowly, finally starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together, you learned that Simeon had died, or undied, or whatever the term is, became a skeleton, I mean. She didn't know what a pirate lord was, but it sounded important. Yes, and I knew that the Order of Souls was bound to put a bounty out on him sooner or later. Whatever memories they were able to get from him, I was sure they'd help lead to Athena's fortune, assuming he ever found it. Adelaide set her empty mug down on the table with a satisfied burp. The most prized treasure of the greatest pirate who ever lived. That's got to be worth chasing, don't you think? Adelaide moved to say more, but was interrupted as Ned stuck his head through the hatchway. What is it? Trouble, Ned said simply. The two women shared a glance and rose swiftly, jogging up the stairs to the upper deck, where Faisal was standing, spyglass in hand, gazing out at the horizon. It would appear that we are being followed, he informed them with none of his usual playfulness. We have changed course twice, and they have matched our heading both times. Is it the order? Lorena asked, squinting, as if she could somehow make out the other ship through sheer force of will. Unlikely, said Adelaide. They're a bunch of hocus-pocus merchants who normally rely on pirates to do their fighting for them. I suppose it's possible they've put a bounty on us, but I've never heard of them doing that for anyone who wasn't a skelly. I never heard of anyone stealing their wares, Faisal suggested grimly. We did make quite a commotion leaving town, however, so it could be that other pirates know we have something worth taking. I think that they must be faster than us, but for now they seem content to keep their distance and let us know that we are being followed. That, or they want to work out where we might be heading before they try and sink us, Adelaide retorted. Any bad weather around? Somewhere we can lose them? I'm not keen for them to know our destination. It might be too late for that, Lorina reminded her. Akulia looked at the parchment too. If we spend time hiding or trying to throw the ship off the scent, we might find their friends have had time to set up an ambush at Tribute Peak. We could take them head on, Ned offered. They might not expect us to hit first. Adelheid pondered this for a moment. Faster is better, she said finally. I want us to see if we can outrun them. If they can't see us, they might give up and turn tail. And at the very least, it'll give us a chance to hide. The crew went about their business tilting the ship's great sails to catch all the wind they could. But even as they tore across the waves, Faisal reported that the other ship continued to gain on them. They could see it with the naked eye now, a dark and ominous smudge on the horizon growing steadily larger. Finally, a frustrated Adelaide ordered all non-essential supplies to be thrown overboard in an effort to lighten the load. Barrels of fruit and dried meat, crates packed with plundered weapons and ammunition, even the bed from the captain's cabin. It all went overboard, one item at a time, along with the spare sails and boxes of gold the crew had built up over the months. Faisal made a point of marking the position on the map in case they one day had a chance to come back. But abandoning all of their treasure, left them in a somber mood indeed. Even Lorina felt curiously glum about having no belongings of her own to surrender, save for the single golden coin tucked safely in her boot. Even with all these sacrifices, though, the other ship continued to bear down upon them. They could see her clearly through the spyglass now. She was a modified galleon that Faisal recognized as the Black Gauntlet, 
reportedly now under the command of a fearsome captain with a reputation for taking home some of the Order's most notable bounties. The Black Gauntlet herself was equally formidable. Her hull had been reinforced with steel bands that Lorena supposed might help brace against cannon fire. Piles of powder kegs had been piled on the deck so that they could be thrown overboard, acting as floating time bombs that could damage and destroy any ship that might pursue them. They could see harpoon guns too, capable of launching vicious spears that could tether two ships together if used effectively, not to mention skewer her crew. Lorena lowered the spyglass momentarily, dazzling herself as the hot sun caught the lens. As she blinked furiously in an effort to keep the purple spots out of her vision, the first vestiges of a plan began to form in her head. She stood for a few moments pondering. There was a good chance something could go wrong, she knew. But there was also a chance everything could go right. Faisal, she called across. What do you know about the captain of that ship? If you are thinking that you can appeal to his better nature, I am not certain that he remembers where he buried it, Faisal shouted back over the roar of the waves. All I know is that his name is Quince, and that he is a military man, strong as an ox, they say. So, he's a soldier, but not a tactician, Lorena thought to herself. Out loud, she asked, If he was a soldier, would he know about flags and signals, things like that? I would suppose. Faisal looked at her curiously. Do you have a plan? If it works, I'll let you know, she called, already halfway up to the ship's wheel. Adelaide, I think I've got us a way out of this, but you're not going to like it. I'm glad you're a pirate, not a politician, because that was a terrible speech, Adelaide grumbled. What won't I like about it? Well, Lorena hesitated, but she'd come this far. All of it, honestly. Oh, and I'm going to have to borrow Ned. Captain Quince, sir! Quince, who had been inspecting the newly installed cannons that ran along the deck of the Black Gauntlet, harumphed at the sound of his name and glanced upward. To his surprise, he saw that the scruffy little ship they were pursuing was beginning to turn, so that its own relatively meagre arsenal was aiming directly at their prow. So they've decided to make a fight of it, have they? He barked. Lucky, I say. I was starting to get bored of the whole bloody cat and mouse game after all. Prepare to fire! Uh, said a nearby deckhand meekly. I, I believe the plan was to bring them in alive, sir? He flinched as Quince rounded on him, for the captain was a great bull of a man, not tall, but as solid as a slab of beef, with a great whiskery moustache that bristled when he was angry, which was often. Two piercing blue eyes bored into the deckhand, who was already regretting ever having spoken. Don't be a bloody idiot, boy, the captain snapped. Bringing prisoners aboard is a fool's game. No, they deserve to be scuppered and scuppered they shall be. Can't have the companies thinking pirates can't get the job done. Or well, that'll be the end of the contracts. Do you want to spend the rest of your life digging up crusty old boxes on a godforsaken beach, lad? Well, uh, no, sir, but... Uh... Precisely! Quince patted the hull of the black gauntlet his pride and joy. Back home, he diligently saved up all his wages from over twenty years of naval service and never managed to afford himself more than a creaky little sloop. Out here on the Sea of Thieves, free from the grasping fingers of the taxman and his cronies, he'd managed to afford himself a fine and distinguished vessel by handing in bounty after bounty. He was not, he vowed, about to let anyone take that away from him. 
As he glared at the rapidly approaching vessel, Quince noticed something strange. A flashing burst of bright light, visible even in the daylight, winking at them with a regular patter. Feeling for the ornate spyglass at his belt and peering down its length, he could see a hulking man with a great mirror, clutched in his outspread arms, tilting it up and down to the instruction of a dark-haired woman at his side. It's a signal, he declared out loud after a moment. They're trying to get our attention, I'd wager. Does that mean then that they want to talk to us, sir? The deckhand inquired cautiously. This was his first voyage, and he'd been hoping for nothing more exciting than a few skeletal bounties that might bring him to the order's attention. Sparring with a crew of living, breathing pirates was another matter entirely, especially given the chaos their targets had already caused. Of course it does, laddie. They probably want to surrender like the lily-livered filchers they are, Quince harumphed. Let's give these cowards our answer, eh? Fire the cannons! He watched in satisfaction as his own ship began to turn, cutting across the Unforgiven's path and striking her twice on her port side. The instant the first blows hit home, the woman sprinted down the steps to the cannons on her own vessel, and Quince barked with laughter at the sight of the large man still dumbly holding the glittering mirror. Ah! Oof! He barked, before ordering his crew to brace for impact. A single cannonball arced through the air from the unforgiven striking the hull of the black gauntlet and causing a small shudder. Only minor damage, sir, someone shouted. We'll have it repaired in a moment. Quince sneered. One cannon. <laughs> Pathetic. He called, hoping that his voice might carry across the waves somehow. Is that the best you can do? He coughed wheezily and then ordered a second volley. This time three of the Black Gauntlet's shots hit their mark. Her crew shouting and jeering as the Unforgiven came close to rolling just from the impact. It's almost too easy. Quince laughed, though this again gave way to a second coughing fit that nearly doubled him over. <laughs> right, he thundered, staring down at the crew with red-rimmed eyes. <laughs> Wish one of you idiots is smoking while we've got powder on a deck. <laughs> All he got in return was a sea of blank expressions, however, and he turned slowly in place trying to find the source of the acrid smell that was washing over him. Finally, Quince's eyes settled on the piled-up powder cakes stacked next to the bow of the ship, close to where he was standing. The powder cakes were smoking and smoldering, becoming extremely hot, thanks to the focused sunlight directed by a large, curved mirror. One or two of them had begun to pop and sputter dangerously. Captain Quince was not a young man, but he impressed his crew that day by executing an acrobatic dive over the railings a few short seconds before the powder kegs exploded in a chain reaction that sent fire across the deck of the Black Gauntlet. Smaller fires erupted in the sails, but no one was left to extinguish them. For many of the crew, had followed their captain into the sea, either hurled overboard by the blast or attempting to escape the roaring flames. Lorina, watching the chaos from afar, was tempted to reload the cannons and exact some very satisfying revenge against the crippled ship. A lurch from below reminded her that the Unforgiven was in no shape to pick a fight, however, even if her opponents couldn't retaliate. Instead, she called to little Ned, who insisted on returning the mirror to the captain's cabin before returning to the sails, and Lorina swiftly set a course that would carry them out of sight. She didn't know whether or not they'd been able to inflict a fatal blow to the black gauntlet or not, 
but she was convinced that she'd bought them enough time to reach Tribute Peak unchallenged. Sure enough, they soon left the other ship far behind, though Lurina still felt unsettled about fleeing from a half-finished fight. The Unforgiven felt sluggish and slow in the water, and although Adelaide and Faisal had been below to repair the damage, Lurina was starting to get concerned about how badly they'd been hit. Ned, she called, unable to completely mask the unease in her voice. I think we're safe for now. Why don't you head below decks and see if you can help the others finish making... She trailed off as Adelaide staggered up the stairs, grunting with exertion, for she was struggling under the weight of Faisal's motionless form. Ned moaned softly and was at her side in an instant, lifting the smaller man effortlessly and laying him out across the deck on a tarpaulin. Lorinna could see a nasty purple bruise across Faisal's head where something had struck him and his breathing was shallow and rapid. I've used up every last scrap of wood and cloth we have left to patch the leaks, Adelaide panted, looking pale and exhausted herself. They hit us too hard, and we're still taking on water from half a dozen places. The ship is sinking, and there's not a damn thing we can do to stop it. Mm. 